partners of Andrew Womack Ministries, celebrating 40 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Today, Andrew illustrates that knowing God is not just for the privileged, not just for those who found a formula. Knowing God is for everyone. Now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I am continuing a teaching that I've been doing for five weeks. This is the uh, fifth week that I've taught on knowing God, which of course has to be considered the basis of everything else. We seek the Lord, not just what He can do for us. That's the root of a lot of problems in the Christian life is that people come to God only when they have a problem. They want their problem fixed, but they don't know God. That's similar to our children when they come to us and they're always wanting the car keys. They're always wanting something to eat. They're always wanting us to do something, but they don't want anything to do with us. You know, that's offensive to a parent. And even though God is big enough that I believe He doesn't, you know, sulk about it or anything like that, that is not what God intended. God wants us to know Him. And once you know God, then everything that God is and everything that God has comes as a result. So this is now the fifth week. This is my last week to be teaching on knowing God. And I've already laid the foundation of how important knowing God is and how that this is really the goal of salvation, how we do it through the Word of God. We need the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus unto us. We've dealt with all of that. And now I've gone back to the very scriptures that I started this series with out of Philippians chapter 3. And let me just go back and read Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. And it says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. Now that's what I talked about yesterday. And what I'm doing this week, we've already put out how important it is to know God how that we do that through the Word of God. And what I'm doing this week is just sharing some of the major things that I believe we have to understand and renew our mind on before we can have an accurate relationship with God. Yesterday I took this verse, Philippians 3, 9, where it says, "...and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law." And I shared how that the Apostle Paul's first thing that he did was come to an end of self-righteousness. Any dependence upon himself that he was earning the favor of God. He had to come to the end of that way of thinking before he could really have relationship with God. And that's what we talked about yesterday. And that's the same thing that happened to me. When I had this experience with the Lord in 1968, I came to the end of my self-righteousness. But it goes on to say, Be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, or this self-righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So this is just kind of like looking at the other side of the coin that I was describing yesterday. Yesterday I was talking about not having self-righteousness, not trusting in ourself, but the flip side of that is that when you start putting faith in what Jesus has done for you, then you receive a righteousness, or that word is a religious term to some people that they really don't know what it means, but it, this is an oversimplification, but it simply means right standing with God. And so instead of having right standing with God based on what I do, when I get out of that self-righteousness, and then just throw myself on the mercy of God and believe on Jesus, I receive the righteousness of Jesus imputed unto me. It's not earned. I don't deserve it. But when I make Jesus my Lord, there's many scriptures on this. One of them that's very obvious is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where it says, For he hath made him to be made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We weren't given just a tiny little bit of righteousness, just a token amount of righteousness, but we were made the righteousness of God. But of Him are we in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus has been made my righteousness. 
And so see, not only do you have to quit trusting in yourself to be in right standing with God, but when you humble yourself and say, Father, I just need a Savior, I put faith in Jesus, God literally imparts unto you righteousness, and it's not an inferior righteous or just a little tiny taste of righteousness, but it says that Jesus has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now, you will often hear people say things like, well, all of our righteousness is just filthy rags. And you know, that is a scripture. And it literally says all our righteousness are like filthy rags. And that's a true statement, but that's talking about self-righteousness. This is in the old covenant before Jesus came and brought in faith righteousness. And if you're just talking about what you can produce on your own without the grace of God and without the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, well, then it's true that all of your self-righteousness is like filthy rags. But in the new covenant, you become a brand new person and you have God you are now made the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and according to 1 Corinthians 1, 30, Jesus is now your righteousness. So if you try and take that same statement that was made in the Old Testament and apply it in the New about all of your righteousness or his filthy rags, then you would be calling Jesus a filthy rag, which certainly is not true. Jesus is the purity, the righteousness, the holiness of God. And in Christ Jesus, we are created in righteousness and true holiness. That's Ephesians 4, 24. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When you get born again, you are created righteous. Let me use these verses out of Romans chapter 10. And if I had more time on this, I could literally go up into the ninth chapter and show you that he was talking about that the whole nation of Israel, this was basically the stumbling block and why they didn't receive Jesus as a whole as their Messiah because they were into self-righteousness. They were trusting that it was their observance of the Sabbath and of the feast and of the sacrifices and their holiness and their actions. They, their faith was in that and they couldn't put faith in themselves and faith in a Savior at the same time. Those are mutually exclusive. And so this is really what caused them to stumble. So that's the point that he made in the ninth chapter. In the 10th chapter, in verse 1, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, this is important that you understand this statement and take it in its context because Paul is not against the Jews. Uh, I'm not against the Jews. I'm not against non faith people who are trusting in their own self. I wish that every person would receive this truth. But you aren't going to get people saved and in right standing with God by just perpetuating the lie. You need to tell people the truth. And sometimes because I tell people the truth and I'm real blunt with it and it's straightforward, there's people that get offended at me and say, you're harsh and all of this. But it's out of love that I tell people the truth. You know, Paul said this in Galatians 4, 16, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You're supposed to speak the love, speak the truth in love. And that's what I'm doing. I'm telling people the truth. Even though it gets me in trouble and people criticize me, I'm doing it because I love you and I'm trying to tell you the truth. That's what Paul's saying. His desire for the Israelites was that they might all be saved. But then he goes on in the next verse and he says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. There's a lot in that verse. But you could say this from that verse, that not everybody who's zealous about knowing God truly knows God. The Jews were zealous. They were talking about God and doing everything that they did, down to the washing of their pots and pans and everything that they had, the cleansing of their hands. They had a rule for everything, how many steps you could take on the Sabbath day. They, they lived a very religious life. You could definitely say that they were zealous, but Paul says it wasn't according to knowledge and it doesn't get the right results. It is absolutely wrong to say that there's many paths that lead to God. That is a lie and a deception of the devil. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man no man, no nation, no person, no exceptions, no man comes to the Father 
but by me. You have to approach God through Jesus. He is the only way to God. There isn't any other path. There's just one way. And so this whole thing about, well, these people are zealous and they're so ardent and they are, they just believe so strong. Sure, faith is going to count for something. No, you have to believe the right thing as revealed by the Word of God. This is what Paul's saying. He says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So see, there is a righteousness that comes from God. And according to other scriptures that I've already mentioned, that righteousness is a gift. It's not something you earn. It's not given in payment for what you have done. It is a gift, and you receive it by faith. It's a faith-based righteousness. And then there is a righteousness that is of our own self, and this is what he's talking about in verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. You know, the terminology that I would probably use here is to establish a self-righteousness or a works-based righteousness that is dependent upon, I've done this and this and this, and now, God, I've got to be in right standing with you because I've denied myself and I've lived holy. Did you know that the vast majority of what is called Christianity today is into this self-righteousness? And many of them have a zeal of God, just like the religious Jews of Paul's day did. But Paul is making it very clear that that isn't enough. Just to be sincere is not enough. You can be sincerely wrong. You've got to go by the Word of God. And the Word of God teaches that this self-righteousness falls short of God's demands. God isn't going to grade us on a curve but relative to how other people are living. No, there is a right and a wrong way, and none of us are ever going to approach God based on our own performance and how holy we live. So therefore, how do you accept God? How do you have a relationship with God? How do you come to know God? It all has to be through Jesus. You are just given righteousness. Here's a verse that goes along and says that in Romans chapter 8. In verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, this last phrase in that first verse, some people use that to totally just strip this verse of all of the power that it has. It says in the first part of the verse, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And that's an obvious truth. The word no condemnation here is an absolute, unqualified negative. It means uh, zilch, nada, zero, no condemnation, no judgment, no guilt towards those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's an obvious truth in Scripture. But then the last part of that verse says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Some people use that phrase about walking after the flesh and after the Spirit to just strip this verse of all of its power and say, well, see, that makes it dependent on whether or not you are seeking God. Well, there's two ways, two things I want to say about this quickly. Again, I could teach on this for an hour. I'm just going to say this very quickly. But first of all, this is not saying that there is condemnation from God. I believe that you could actually say it this way, and you would be absolutely correct in what is being said here in the context, that there is therefore now no condemnation from God towards them who are in Christ Jesus. But if you are walking in the flesh, there could be condemnation from the devil. That is basically the point that's being made. So the first thing is, this isn't saying that God is condemning and making people feel guilty. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are totally accepted with the Father based on whether or not you have put faith in Jesus. But does that mean that you're just free to go live in sin? Well, that means God is going to accept you based on your faith in Jesus, not based on your holiness. But if you don't live a holy life, then there can be condemnation, not from God, but from the devil or from people. For instance, some of you could be at home watching my program. You could be getting blessed and, and, 
set free by this thinking about, man, that God's not angry at me. And so because God's not angry at you, get in your car and just go driving down the road at twice what the speed limit is. And even though God won't condemn you, God loves you because you have put faith in the Lord Jesus, I guarantee you the, the law officers, the police are going to catch you and they will condemn you. There will be a judgment. If it's severe enough, you can be thrown into jail and you could suffer a lot of condemnation, but it's not going to come from God. So I just say these things. That's real brief, but I'm saying that this doesn't undo the statement here that there is absolutely no condemnation from God towards those who are in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 2 it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness and sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That's talking about he condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus. He judged sin in Jesus. He punished Jesus for what you and I were supposed to do. And he didn't give Jesus just a little token amount of punishment. He took his wrath. God the Father took his wrath against the sin and ungodliness of every person who has ever lived or who ever will live, all of the human creation, for time, eternity, past, to eternity, future, he took all of the human race sin and put it in Jesus and punished Jesus in the flesh of the Lord Jesus. There isn't any anger left in God towards you. He's already judged Jesus. Therefore, you do not have to somehow or another continue to appease an angry God who is mad over your sins. God has already forgiven all of your sins, past, present, and even future tense sins. Man, that is nearly too good to be true, but that's exactly what this is talking about. And in verse 4, it gives you the results of this. Here's the reason that he did this, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Again, the righteousness of the law is never, never fulfilled in a person based on your own actions. This isn't saying that since Jesus died for us now, we can be perfect and holy and without flaws. That's not what this is saying. But it's saying that because Jesus suffered our punishment, paid for our sins, he took our sins upon himself, and he in turn gives us his righteousness not in payment for anything, but as a free gift to those who will humble themselves, admit that they can't save themselves and just throw themselves on him for mercy, put faith in what he did, then he makes you righteous. And again, I refer back to 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is that same principle I've just described uh, put into one verse. It says, For he made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not the righteousness of man, not the righteousness of our own, but the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what Romans chapter 8 verse 4 says, that now the righteousness of the law, just as if we had lived perfect, as if we had never sinned, you know, that's my little layman's definition of what the word justified means. It means just as if I'd never sinned, just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. That's what happens. It's God has placed all of your sins in Jesus. He judged that sin in the flesh of Jesus. And now you have right standing, righteousness with God, not based on your own righteousness, but based on your faith in Jesus. And this is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 10, that the Jews were zealous, but they were trying to establish their own righteousness. They were approaching God on the basis of their own goodness, thinking, God, I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. Certainly now you're going to accept me. See, that's the Pharisee in Jesus' parable. But the publican, a tax collector who was a thief and an outcast, actually a treasonous person who collaborated with the Romans, the tax collector, the publican just fell down and said, God, have mercy on me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. 
And Jesus said that the man who pled for mercy and put his faith in the goodness of God was the one who was justified, not the holy person who fasted twice every week and paid tithes even down to the spices in his garden. See, most people today would look at those two people and think, well, surely this person is living a holier life. God's going to accept him. But in the parable Jesus gave, the person who was the crook, who was the liar, who was a traitor, was the one who was in right standing with God because he asked for it by grace and put faith in the grace of God instead of in his own works. And I tell you, this same problem is being reproduced over and over and over in the body of Christ today. People don't know this. Our whole series that I've been on for over a month now is talking about knowing God. If you are going to go very far in your relationship with God, you are going to have to know Him as your righteousness. You can't trust in your own righteousness. You've got to turn from that. That's what I talked about yesterday, getting rid of this self-righteousness. And now you have to turn and understand that when you put your faith in the Lord, He makes you the righteousness of God. The literal righteousness of the law, as if you had been perfect, has now been placed on the inside of you. In your spirit, you are as righteous and holy and pure as Jesus is. And I know some of you struggle on that. You just nearly choke. Because again, you're looking on the outer appearance only. You don't understand that you're a new person on the inside. You don't functionally have an understanding of the spirit realm. You just look at your actions and you probe your thoughts and your emotions. And if you can't see perfection and holiness there, then you don't believe it exists. You functionally, you don't realize that there is more to you than just your physical body and your soul. But in the spirit realm, that's the part of you that got changed. And in the spirit, you are a brand new person. And you must approach God in spirit and in truth. That's what John 4, 24 says. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's the spirit part of you that has now received righteousness if you have made Jesus your Lord. And so if you want to really know God, you've got to turn from self-righteousness. And as you turn from self-righteousness, you have to throw yourself on the mercy of God and accept a righteousness which comes by faith. And that's what Paul said in this scripture I began the program with over in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of God by faith. You have to receive this righteousness from God. You can't earn it. It doesn't come out of you. It comes to you as a gift, and it's by faith. You know, again today, I'm going to make a special offer, an additional offer to our normal teaching on knowing God, and this will cover what I've talked today about righteousness. It's an album that I've entitled, Whose Righteousness? There's three teachings in this, and I tell you, it is powerful, and it would just give you a lot more information on what I was trying to describe today. This is a must if you want to really know God. So please listen to our announcer as he gives you this information and call or write and receive these materials and then join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's five-part teaching titled Knowing God was captured live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available in a CD or DVD album for a gift of 16 pounds or more. For the CD album, ask for number T1058 or request the DVD series T3203. You can also get Andrew's teachings as seen on TV by asking for DVD album number T1058 when you send a gift of 16 pounds or more. The fifth teaching in the audio CD album, What the Word Reveals About God, is also available for a donation of three pounds or more. We encourage everyone to send a gift, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this fifth teaching free of charge. Today, in addition to our normal offer that we've been offering for over a month now about knowing God, I'm also offering this album that I have entitled, Who's Righteousness? And it's based on some of these same scriptures I use today, but it's uh, four and a half hours worth of teaching, so it's a lot amplified. And it just goes through and uses a lot of scripture to make this point that you don't stand right with God through what you do but through putting faith in what Jesus did for you. 
this is foundational. If you're going to know God, you must understand this. And this teaching would be a real blessing. So please take advantage of this additional teaching on whose righteousness. Today, Andrew mentioned the three CD album titled, Whose Righteousness? Ask for album number T1022C, Whose Righteousness, when you contact the ministry. Our web address is awme.net. You can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. Again, that's 01922-473-300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473-300. Helpline hours extend from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If you prefer to write us, our address is AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. We hope to hear from you today. You know, I'm really excited about coming to Europe. I've got a tour coming up in October and I'm gonna be in England. I'll be holding a meeting up in Newcastle upon Tyne. We've also got a minister's conference that we'll be doing in Buxton, England. And then I'll be going to St. Petersburg, Russia. I'll be ministering in our Karis Bible College there as well as a church there in St. Petersburg. I'm also going to Holland, Amsterdam, Holland, and I'll be ministering there. And I'm really excited about this. We are getting a lot of response from all of these European areas, and so it's really exciting for me to go there to minister to you, to get to meet you, so if you can, listen as our announcer gives you the specific about this and join me for one of these services. Andrew's teaching, Discover the Keys to Staying Full of God, is now available in book form. You can order your copy today for a gift of seven pounds or more to the work of this ministry. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more gospel truth. The law was sent to bind us and to actually increase the amount of sin or the damage that sin did in our life. It was to literally put us under such a heavy yoke and such a heavy burden that if we thought we could be good enough and that somehow or another we could live holy enough to earn God's favor, for people who are self-righteous, it just increased the standard of what God's holiness was to such a degree that nobody could ever keep it. And the logic behind this was that it was to make you despair of self-righteousness. And it was to make you throw yourself upon God for mercy. But again, one of the slickest deceptions that Satan has ever put across on the earth is through the church, he has deceived the church into thinking that God gave the law so that by us keeping all of these laws, we could earn God's favor. And that's not true. That's tomorrow on Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack.